Hello, AP Bio students. Um, we're going to go ahead and start the last set of notes for Unit 3, um, the 3.3 notes, which is all about photosynthesis. Um, <clears throat> in this video, we're going to specifically look at the first topic, which is a pretty thorough introduction to um, photosynthesis. And so in this topic, we're going to go over um, kind of a, a handful of things that are important important to know about as we try to process what's going on during photosynthesis, some good background information and a nice little overview of what's going to take place during photosynthesis. And so we're going to jump right into it. The first thing I want <clears throat> to talk about is the difference between an autotroph and a heterotroph. And so um, photosynthesis is a, a metabolic process that's going to take place in autotrophs. Autotrophs are organisms who um, uh, what, well, like it says in your notes, it, these are organisms that can sustain themselves without um, eating or consuming something from another living organism. Um, and so basically an autotroph can build its own organic molecules from scratch. And when I say from scratch, basically what they're able to do is they're able to take random inorganic molecules from their environment, so small, random, inorganic molecules from their environment that aren't from other living things, they're just from um, the abiotic features of their environment from the, the soil or the air. And they're able to take these compounds like carbon dioxide molecules and, and, and water molecules and sulfates in the soil and things like that. <clears throat> and then they're able to build organic molecules from that within their cells. That's what an autotroph is able to do. They can start building organic molecules like carbohydrates and proteins and nucleic acids and lipids from the starting molecules that are not organic molecules. Um, this is unique to autotrophs because um, a lot of organisms can't do that. Um, there's, there's organisms called heterotrophs who, who can't build their own organic molecules from scratch. They have to start off with organic molecules that came from other living organisms. And so that's why they have to consume other living things to, to, to start making that stuff. But in autotrophs, they're able to do that. So pretty cool little ability there. We call them the producers and ecosystems because they're going to basically provide the, the base of every food chain. Um, so every, they are going to supply all the organic molecules that are going to be needed to sustain all the other um, non-autotrophs in the environment, all the heterotrophs that can't build their own organic materials. Um, there's two types of autotrophs that you guys need to know for this class. There's chemoautotrophs and then there's photoautotrophs. Um, a chemoautotroph is an autotroph who can build organic molecules using carbon dioxide. So that's going to be... Um, basically important always for an autotroph is they're going to start with some CO2 molecules. Um, and then they're going to need a source of energy to start turning that CO2 into more complex organized molecules that we see in organic molecules, um, which is something the universe doesn't want. The universe doesn't want CO2 molecules, which are these small, simple molecules to become these more complex organized molecules that we see in, in living things, these organic molecules. And so there's going to be an input of energy needed. Chemoautotrophs are going to use energy from other chemical molecules in their environment, they're going to use chemical energy from um, other molecules in their environment to provide the energy needed to turn CO2 into organic molecules. Um, and so some of those um, inorganic compounds that they're going to steal chemical energy from are, are some examples are hydrogen sulfide, sulfur, iron, ammonia, these different um, chemicals they're going to find in their environment, and they're going to use that chemical energy and apply it towards turning CO2 into organic molecules. Those are called chemoautotrophs. Um, a lot of mainly chemoautotrophs are just going to consist of, of bacteria and archaea bacteria, so prokaryotic organisms. There are certain prokaryotic organisms that are chemoautotrophs that are able to do this, and they usually live in very extreme environments is where we find these chemoautotrophs, um, environments that lack um, sunlight, for example, um, and have extreme temperatures or pHs. That's where we usually find these chemoautotrophs. Um, we don't really focus on those guys. What we're going to focus on this class is photoautotrophs, which are going to do, be doing the the same thing, whereas they're, they're going to take carbon dioxide molecules and turn it into more complex organic molecules, um, which is going to require a source of energy, but they're not going to use the energy from, they're not going to use chemical energy from these other molecules in their environment. They're going to actually use light energy from the sun, and they're going to use energy from the sun, sunlight energy, light energy, to um, power the production of CO2 molecules turning into more organized organic molecules. So that's the different photo, meaning light, 
photoautotrophs. So they're autotrophs, they're using light energy to build organic materials, whereas chemoautotrophs are autotrophs who are using chemical energy to build organic molecules. That's the big difference. And so photosynthetic organisms um, are, or, or, are organisms that can do photosynthesis, and photosynthesis is going to be the process of taking that light energy and using it to now build organic molecules with that we see happening in photoautotrophs. And so this is going to include things like plants um, and other photosynthetic, photosynthetic organisms, um, which isn't just necessarily plants. Um, there's also algae, um, which is not technically a plant, but it's, it's photosynthetic um, cells and photosynthetic organisms that exist. And then there's also cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are um, prokaryotic cells that can do photosynthesis. So there are some prokaryotic cells that can do photosynthesis along with eukaryotic organisms who can do photosynthesis. Um, and so that's what we're gonna be looking at a lot in, in these notes is, is how that process takes place. And that's different than hetero, hetero, heterotrophs like I was explaining earlier. Heterotrophs can't do any of that. They cannot build their own organic molecules from scratch. They have to, to consume other living organisms to, to to, to get some starting organic molecules to work with. Um, and so we call them consumers, and they're the ones um, in ecosystems, they are eating producers, autotrophs, and other heterotrophs. Um, and that includes things like herbivores, omnivores, carnivores, and decomposers, things that eat plants or um, other animals, um, or who eat both, or who eat dead things, anything that's eating other living organisms, um, or organisms that were once alive, is going to be a, a heterotroph. Uh, and again, that includes a lot of eukaryotic organisms and um, many types of prokaryotic organisms. So let's talk about photosynthesis and how this process takes place. So in photosynthesis, what we're doing is, uh, we're not what us, what we're doing, but what autotrophs are doing is they're taking energy from light and transforming that into energy that now exists in organic molecules. So they're taking light energy and turning it into chemical energy that's now found in these nice organized molecules. Um, this takes place in the green portion of plants, um, is where a lot of photosynthesis is going to take place. Um, and in those cells that make up the green portion of plants, they contain a lot of chloroplast, which is the organelle responsible for carrying out photosynthesis. Here's the overall equation. Um, you're going to take some carbon dioxide molecules and some water molecules along with some energy from the sun, some light energy. And we're going to use that to transform those molecules into um, glucose or sugar um, and oxygen. Um, and so uh, a lot of times when we're looking at photosynthesis, uh, this is the summarized equation that we see. Six molecules for every glucose molecule that's being produced, which is our, our kind of initial organic molecule that's being produced in these plants through photosynthesis. We're starting with six molecules of CO2 and six molecules of H2O to make one molecule of glucose, which is then going to also release six molecules of oxygen. This is the exact opposite of um, the, the products and reactants that we saw in cell respiration. And so a lot of this will, will basically be like cell respiration, but in reverse. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so uh, photosynthesis, just like cell respiration, um, is an oxidation reduction reaction. We call it a redox reaction. There is an overall movement of electrons taking place that we're going to see when we dive into topic two and three. And so what's going to happen now is um, in photosynthesis, we're basically going to undo what happened in cell respiration. So in cell respiration, glucose was losing electrons and becoming CO2 molecules. Well, now we're going to give those electrons back to CO2 um, which is going to then uh, cause CO2 molecules to become glucose again. So CO2 molecules are going to be reduced in photosynthesis. They're going to gain electrons. And as they start gaining electrons, it's going to slowly start producing um, glucose or sugar, C6H12O6. Um, so we're, we're basically undoing what happened in cell respiration. In cell respiration, glucose lost electrons and was oxidized, becoming CO2. Well, now... CO2 is going to gain electrons and turn back into to glucose molecules inside of plants. Um, and those electrons come from water. So in photosynthesis, water is going to be oxidized. We're going to take away electrons from water. And when um, we take away those electrons from water, it's going to turn into oxygen. Just like in cell respiration, oxygen gained electrons, was reduced and gained electrons and became water. Well, now water is going to be oxidized to lose electrons and go back into being oxygen. And so basically what's going to happen is these electrons from water 
they're going to be taken from water and given to CO2. So we're going to see this flow of electrons from water, and then they're going to be taken and given to CO2 molecules, who um, is going to result then in the, the CO2 becoming glucose and the water becoming oxygen. And so that's be what's being reduced and oxidized in, in photosynthesis. Um, now, where this is taking place in cells is, is for a lot of plants, um, if we're talking about plants specifically, this is usually taking place in the leaves of plants. That's where a lot of photosynthesis is taking place. The whole function of leaves is to provide a location where a lot of sunlight can be um, absorbed and a lot of photosynthesis can occur. Um, and so real quick, just some basic um, anatomy here of a leaf. Uh, this is, so in a, in a leaf, if we looked at a, a cross section of a leaf, meaning like if you took a leaf and you like cut it in half and then we're able to zoom in into the interior of that leaf after cutting it, um, you'd see something like this. So these are the two sides of the leaf, the top of the leaf, the bottom of the leaf. And here's the inside tissue of the leaf. If you really zoom in on it, that internal tissue, we call the mesophyll. The mesophyll is this internal um, these cells that make up the interior of the leaf, and then you have the, the outside of the leaf. Um, the, uh, the bottom of leaves usually have these small pores or openings called stomata. So stoma stomata are these small um, openings that we see usually on the bottom side of a leaf. So like in this picture on the bottom of a leaf, if you were to look under a microscope, you'd see these tiny microscopic holes. This is where gas can exchange between the leaf and the atmosphere. So in this case, carbon dioxide, there's a, a lot of movement of carbon dioxide going into the stomata where all these cells are because they're going to need carbon dioxide to do photosynthesis. And in photosynthesis, oxygen is being produced, and that oxygen is released from the leaf through the stomata. So you have oxygen going out as a result of photosynthesis and CO2 going in um, through these, these holes in the leaf. Um, and then in the, the mesophyll tissue, like I was saying, these cells that make up the inside of the leaf, um, this is where you're going to find a bunch of chlorophyll. So these cells contain um, lots and lots of chloroplasts. So if you were to take one of these mesophyll cells, you're going to see that that cell is filled with chloroplast. And chloroplast is the organelle where all this photosynthesis stuff is happening, as we'll see in topic two and three of these notes. Um, but just some basic uh, recap of the structure of a chloroplast. You guys are supposed to know the basic structure of a chloroplast, which we talked about back in unit I remember unit two, we talked about chloroplast very briefly, but here's a bigger picture to kind of show you the structure of the chloroplast. The chloroplast has, um, this is the organelle, an organelle found in plant cells. It has an outer membrane and an inner membrane, so it has a double membrane. Um, and then there's a space between those two membranes called the intermembrane space. And then um, within the inner membrane, there's actually another set of membranes called the thylakoids, which are these, these membrane discs that we see here. Um, these flattened membrane and discs, we call them thylakoids. That's these, these discs here that are stacked on top of each other. A stack of thylakoids is called a granum. A granum is a stack of these thylakoids, which we see a lot of these thylakoids stacked inside of the chloroplast. Um, and then you have two spaces here. You have the space inside the thylakoid. There's actually a, a, um, an internal space inside these discs. So if you can, there's actually a space inside of here inside the thylakoid membranes, these discs, that's called the thylakoid lumen or the thylakoid space. It's the, the space inside the thylakoid. And then outside the thylakoid is the rest of this space here called the stroma. The stroma is the space outside the thylakoid and the thylakoid lumen is the space inside the thylakoid membrane. And so lots of different spaces here and different membranes that make up the chloroplast. Um, but we'll be looking at those a lot when we look at where all this photosynthesis stuff is happening in a lot more detail. And then um, a few more things <clears throat> in topic one. Uh, um, this gives you a, a this slide gives you kind of an overview of, of topic two and three of what we're going to talk about. There's there's two parts of photosynthesis, or we could we could say that photosynthesis takes place in two phases. Um, there's the light reactions, and then there's the the Calvin cycle. Um, those are the two main phases of photosynthesis that we'll look at in a lot of detail in topics two and three. Um, but right now, it's good to maybe have, a, at least in topic one, have a, a, a nice overview of what's going to happen in these two types of reactions. So in the light reactions, this takes place in the thylakoids. 
those little discs that I was showing you. And in the thylakoids, there's these reactions where um, water molecules are going to be broken apart using energy from light. So light energy is going to be absorbed um, by uh, these these uh, the, the thylakoids here. And that light energy is going to be used to split open water molecules. Um, and those water molecules are going to be split into to oxygen, electrons, and hydrogen atoms. And so what's going to happen is the water molecule is going to be um, used in the light reactions, and it's going to become oxygen. Um, and we're going to take away the electrons from water. So we're going to take away the electrons from water along with its hydrogen atoms. We're going to take away the electrons and the hydrogen atoms because they kind of travel together. That's going to happen here in the light reactions, um, which is going to result in the production of oxygen. Once water loses those electrons, it becomes oxygen. So this is where water is being um, oxidized, losing its electrons. And so those electrons are then going to be given, along with those hydrogen atoms, we're going to give that to um, an electron carrier molecule called NADP+. So NADP+, is going to come pick up those electrons from what used to belong to water and take those electrons away. And when NAD+, picks up, NADP+, picks up those electrons, it becomes NADPH during the light reactions. So... That's what happens in the light reaction. So in the thylakoid, water is going to go in. Energy from light is going to be used to take the electrons away from water and give those electrons to NADP+. It's going to take those electrons away. This results in the production of oxygen. And then you have the Calvin cycle. The Calvin cycle takes place in the stroma, so the space outside the thylakoids. And in that space, you have a series of reactions that are going to occur where carbon dioxide molecules are going to ultimately become um, sugar or glucose. Um, and that's going to require um, NADPH. Those electrons are going to be dropped off during the Calvin cycle and given to these carbon dioxide molecules as they start becoming and being put together to build glucose. Um, it's going to require those electrons that were stolen from the light reactions to be brought here. And then NADPH, when he drops off those electrons, will go back to being NAD+. Another important thing that I forgot to mention is that in the light reactions, there's actually some ATP that's made. So in the, um, and we'll look at that in topic two, but during the light reactions, there's going to be ATP that's made. And that ATP and the NADPH that's made in the light reactions is going to be used to feed the Calvin cycle. The Calvin cycle is gonna need that ATP and the NADPH, um, those electrons to, to, to turn CO2 into sugar. So that's the, the two main processes that we're gonna see during photosynthesis. That's like a, a general overview of this picture here. Of, of what's about to happen. And so you're going to, if you look here, the inputs here for photosynthesis, you, you have water and CO2 going into these reactions. And then ultimately coming out of these reactions are oxygen and sugar. Um, so there's that. And then the very last thing in topic one that I want to talk about is just um, a basic, um, well, just a, some background information about light and what this this light energy is um, and how it's being absorbed by plants. So <laughs> hopefully in your previous science class, you learned about the electromagnetic spectrum and how this kind of shows you um, the different uh, types of electromagnetic radiation that exist. And so light is a type of electromagnetic radiation um, that we can visibly see, that the human eye can see but it consists of, of these packets of energy called photons that are traveling through space in waves at the speed of light, very, very fast. And so you have these small packets of energy called photons traveling in the waves at the speed of light. And those waves have different wavelengths, um, which determine what type of radiation, what type of, of, of electromagnetic radiation it is. There's, there's light or photons that travel in very long waves. And then there's light or photon that travels in very, very, very small waves. Um, so in this picture here, you can see longer wavelengths versus smaller wavelengths. And that's going to determine the type of energy that we're talking about here. But there's a small sliver here of wavelengths. So if, if the light is traveling in these wavelengths here between 750 nanometers all the way to like 350 nanometers in this area here, these are wavelengths of light that our eyes can detect that we can visibly see. And it's a lot of these wavelengths that plants are absorbing the energy from these wavelengths here. And those wavelengths correspond to different colors. So depending on the wavelength at which those photons, that energy is traveling, is going to be um, 
corresponding to a different color. So you can see that red has wavelengths around 700 um, and higher nanometers, and purple is a lot smaller, it's 400 nanometers. And so we're, red light has a long wavelength like this, very long wavelength, stretched out wavelengths. Um, this is not to scale. And then purple light has very short wavelengths. Um, and depending on which wavelengths are hitting our eyes, we see different colors. But that's uh, my quick little background information on light that you should hopefully have learned in a previous science class. But in plants, here's what's going to happen. We're going to take certain wavelengths and we're going to absorb the energy from certain wavelengths of that light. And then there's some wavelengths of light that we're not absorbing energy from. So there's these molecules called pigments. Pigments are molecules that absorb certain wavelengths of, of visible light. We call those pigments. And in photosynthesis, the, the main pigment involved in photosynthesis is chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a pigment molecule found in these thylakoids, actually. In these thylakoids, there's this chlorophyll pigment molecule. And what it does is it can take... Um, energy from the sunlight and sunlight is giving off all the different wavelengths it's giving off red wavelengths and yellow wavelengths and green wavelengths and blue red links red wavelengths and violet red wavelengths there's all these different wavelengths of light coming from the sun and chlorophyll these pigments in plants and the and the thylakoids of the chloroplast they when they receive all these when all these wavelengths of light are hitting it they actually are able to absorb certain wavelengths, and then there's other wavelengths that they're not able to absorb, that either get reflected or transmitted through them. And so if you look at this picture here, what it's showing you is that chlorophyll um, is able to absorb um, certain colors here, certain wavelengths. It's able to absorb blue and violet light and red and orange light. But the, the, the wavelength that it's not able to absorb is green. So green is actually the wavelength of light that plants are not using. So plants appear green because out, out of all the wavelengths of all these different wavelengths and colors that are hitting the plant, many of those wavelengths and colors are being absorbed by these pigment molecules. They're absorbing the energy from, from some of those wavelengths, but the green wavelengths are not being absorbed. That's energy that the plant's not using. So energy that comes from green light, the plant the chlorophyll and the pigment molecules in plants, they're not able to really use that pigment, at least chlorophyll isn't able to use it. And that's what's being kind of rejected here from the plant. And it's either gonna pass through the plant or be reflected from the plant. And that's what's gonna hit our eyes. So when we're looking at a plant and you're looking at leaves on a plant, you're seeing the green light because that's the light that they're not, that's the energy they're not absorbing is the gist of what's going on there. And so there's these things called absorption spectrums. These absorption spectrums show you um, different wavelengths of light and how much of their energy is being absorbed by certain pigments. So on here, on this absorption spectrum, we're looking at three different pigments. These are common pigments found in plants. There's chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, um, and then there's pigments called carotenoids. These are three different types of, of pigments found in plants. Um, and what you can see here is like, if you just look for chlorophyll A, Chlorophyll A is able to absorb purple light and purplish blue light, but then when it comes to like blue and green and yellow light, it's not really able to absorb that light. But then over here where it's orange and red, it is able to absorb some of that light over there. Um, and then if you look at chlorophyll B, another pigment that's found in plants, um, again, you can see that it absorbs like these bluer colors and not so much these green or yellow colors. Um, <clears throat> and then some of these orange colors. And so the colors that that's not absorbing are like the green yellow color. So it comes off as like this light green color. Whereas chlorophyll A, it's not really absorbing these blue green colors, blue green yellowish colors. So it comes off as a more bluish green. And then carotenoids, <coughs> this is a different type of pigment. If you guys look here, it's absorbing like purple light and blue light, not really any of this green well, some of the green, but not a lot of it. And then a lot of this yellow and red and orange light, it's not absorbing any of that light. All this yellow, orange, red light, it's not being absorbed by carotenoid pigments. So those wavelengths are being not absorbed. That's the pigments that, those are the wavelengths we're gonna see from carotenoids. And so that produces like an orangish color. Um, so carotenoid pigments look orange because they're not using yellow or orange or red light. Um, 
And um, actually, fun fact, like carrots, the vegetable, which are orange, they actually have a huge amount of carotenoid pigments, hence the name of carotenoids. Um, they're named after, well, actually, I don't know if it's, if it's the vegetable named after the pigment or if the pigment's named after the vegetable. I don't know which one, but carrots have a lot of carotenoids, which is why they appear orange because they're not absorbing a lot of that light. And then this graph down here at the bottom, it's showing you, okay, in terms of photosynthesis, what wavelengths are contributing to, to powering photosynthesis? And you can see that photosynthesis here, it's being powered by this purple light and these blue lights. But when it comes to these green lights right here, there's not really any pigments that plants have that absorb any of this light. They have some pigments that absorb these kinds of lights and this kind of light and this color and light and this kind of light, but there's nothing really, none of these pigments really absorb this, this green yellow light right here. And so that's, that type of light is pretty useless for photosynthesis because th those wavelengths, like I showed you, aren't really being absorbed by the plant and by the plant's pigments. But then some of that orange and red light is being absorbed by these other pigment molecules here. And so, um, again, the reason plants, a lot of plants appear green is because that's the light that they're not really able to use for photosynthesis. Their pigment molecules aren't really absorbing that light. So I hope those uh, this spectrum here makes sense. What This is called an absorption spectrum, but it's just showing you what wavelengths are being absorbed by certain pigments. This graph is showing you three different pigments and which wavelengths are being absorbed by those pigments. Um, and so that's, I think that's basically basically it for these notes for topic one. Um, nice big chunk of information there, some background about all the stuff related to photosynthesis. Uh, but that's it. Uh, I'll see you guys later. Thanks for watching.